Hello and welcome. In Arcadia Avenue, the houses have names as well as numbers. Shangri-La, Dunroman, more repose. They best sum up the avenue's air of nostalgic gentility. Built in the early 30s, all is very discreetly orthodox. From the privacy of privet hedge and lace curtains at the front, to the squares of handkerchief-sized lawn at the back. In later years, however, professional nameplates have appeared on several of the front gateposts. Brigadoon now houses Chetney, Chetney, and Chetney accountants. Dunroman, complete with monkey tree, a veterinary surgeon. Higher up the avenue, there is an establishment for the fitting of ladies' foundation garments. But it is to the recently renamed Celestina that our attention must finally turn. The first thing one notices is that its brass nameplate is somewhat grimier than the others. It pronounces Miss Griselda Thorpe to be medium and clairvoyant, consultations and ministrations strictly by appointment only. Every Wednesday afternoon, promptly at three of the clock, Mr. Henry Jollett climbs the gravel path, presses the front door bell button, and anticipates, at the going rate of one guinea per session, yet another preview of eternity. Ah, my dear Mr. Jollett. Miss Edith, I trust I'm not premature. No, 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 quite the contrary. Punctual to the very second as usual. Punctuality, my dear Mr. Jollett, the prerogative of kings. In my books, whatever, or anybody else's for that matter. Edie! Yes, Griselda, stop catching blue bottles. <laughs> Assist me with the sacred pendant. Yes, Griselda. Uh, I, I, I can't quite oh, see... Fingers and thumbs, fingers and thumbs. There. Mr. Jollett? Drill as before, if you please. You there, in the hot seat. Thank you. I shall sit here, with my back to the window. Better for vibes and less chance of spiritual dispersion, don't you know? And Edie, you... Edie, where have you got to? Here, yeah, Griselda, I've been here all along. Really, I have. But I don't want you here, dear. I want you there, in the third chair. <laughs> of course. How silly. Mm. There. You can begin now, Griselda. Thank you, dear. We will join hands in a circle of eternal light and harmony. Well, do it as though you meant it, woman, for heaven's sake. Hands, harmony. The man's not a flat fish. Oh, yes, Griselda. <sighs> peace. Perfect peace. Peace. Perfect peace. Peace. It started, Mr. Jollett. You can always tell when it started. Are you there? Are you there, oh mighty Manco Kapak, Emperor of the Inca, beloved of the sun? Her spirit guide, you know. I have had the pleasure. Speak, O oh mighty one. Is there anybody there? He's there. Speak. Speak. It is I, Manco Kapak, Emperor of the Inca, beloved of the sun. God living, God incarnate, God of the infinite orb. This is where her breathing gets heavier. You'll see. <sighs> Speak, O oh Manco Kapak, Emperor of your peoples, spirit guide to lesser mortals bound in bonds of common clay. 
Above the land of Cusco, the condor flies high in search of the lamb that has strayed. Oh, dear. Our fields lie fallow, our storehouses empty. The living seed of promise has burnt itself to hash. I don't like the sound of that at all. Prepare then, my people, prepare ye. Climb, oh, climb thy temple mountain. Annoying to his sacred unctions, this our human sacrifice. See, oh, see where the living god of the orb, the chariot of the sun, spins gold upon this holy place. Raise high the sacred blade. The time of the living blood is upon us. The time is now. Now! Oh! Edith, stop daydreaming and pass Mr. Jollett the last of those chocolate digestives. Oh, yes. uh, Mr. Jollett? Uh, no, thank you, Miss Edie. Oh, oh well. <laughs> Piggy to the trough? I'll have it. Uh, Edie, while you're on your feet, you can put Capac's sacred pendant back in the casket where it belongs. There. Beautiful, isn't it, Mr. Jollett? Beautiful. Quite beautiful. Mm. I'd let you take a closer peek, but I don't think the old boy would go for that. Even letting Edie get her chocolatey little paws on it is stretching the point. But at least in the family, if you take my meaning. Of course. Oh, at least let me top you up. I beg your pardon? Uh, oh, no, no, thank you. It's most kind. Ah, oh, downhearted. <laughs> I don't blame you. Three Wednesdays in a row and still no contact with the dear departed, eh? Well, not yet, Griselda. Though the Emperor did seem to have rather a lot on his mind. Oh? Mm. I rely on Edie to keep me in the picture, you know. Huh? <laughs> Have to, don't I, old thing? <laughs> Once his nibs takes over, out of my hands. Everything up to him, and when it's all over, the old memory slate wiped clean. Just like it had never happened. But you must have some idea. Griselda did try getting it on tape in the early days. Tried's the word. Oh? Not a sausage. First couple of times, just put it down to Sister Edie making her usual bosh oh, of it. Griselda! Well... Not exactly of a mechanical bent, old thing, let's face it. If she ever got around to fixing a fuse, she'd probably blow up Battersea Power uh, Station. Uh, so, what happened? Happened? <laughs> Nothing. Funny thing about it, though, all the early stuff, us getting settled, the odd bit of traffic noises from the avenue, Edie's ridiculous asides, mm, all uh, clear as a bell. But the minute Manco Capac starts doing his stuff, Nothing. Perhaps you were too far off the microphone. No further than any of the others. And from what Edie tells me, his nibs is not exactly the sotto voce type. Not exactly. Still, three weeks on the trot and still no contact with the dear departed. If he doesn't pull his finger out soon, you'll be asking for your lolly back. Oh, dear lady, it never entered my mind. Odd, though. Odd? Don't have many failures, do we, Edie, old thing? The first I can remember, Griselda. If your dear... Departed wife... Violet, Griselda. Violet, quite. Well, old Manco Capac can usually be relied upon to winkle them out. Not that there'd be much persuading needed, mind you. Huh? Or put yourself in Violet's place. Like being told there's a long-distance phone call. Not even bothering to find out who's on the other end. I never quite thought of it in that light. I wonder what... Light, you had thought of it in, Mr. Jollett. I notice you've been admiring my sister's portrait, Mr. Jollett. What? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it had rather caught my eye. Splendid, isn't it? Edie. Oh, but it is, Griselda, dear. Such an excellent likeness. Give or take 20 years. Oh, such fire. Such expression. Indeed. Cleopatra, don't you know? Oh, really? Not the old Vic, Mr. Jollett. Finsbury Park Empire. What they call in the business a bum week. 
Not the title role, either. Though that's clearly the impression my sister wishes to give. Fatatatita. 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 Trusted and rather boring handmaiden to the Queen, don't you know? She's the one that brings that awful rubber snake on at the end. The trickiest part was getting the name right. Fatatatita. I still have nightmares. Painted by a fellow artiste, Mr. Jollity. Better at painting than acting. But then everybody in the company seemed better at something than acting. Of course, I had realised your background was probably theatrical. <laughs> Only probably. Oh, oh, my dear man, such understatement. That isn't to imply... The ham of all hams. Always was, always will be. Why, I eventually had the good sense to give it up. Anyway, twenty years on, water under the bridge. And sure, you must have better things to do than go up at pathetic shortcomings of an aspiring Sarah Bernhardt. How interesting. Mr. Jollett? How very interesting. Twenty years. You did say twenty years. Give or take? Why do you ask? In the painting, you're already wearing... The sacred pendant. Am I? Uh, uh, oh, oh, yes. Yeah. So I am. Aren't I? Griselda's feeling of being caught out did not escape either Edie's or Mr. Jollett's notice. To begin with, Griselda half choked on her chocolate digestive, then lapsed into a granite like silence, which made the gentleman shift uneasily on the edge of his seat, drop a spoon, and finally invent a previous engagement, and so beat a grateful retreat. Griselda, what are you doing? What does it look as though I'm doing? I am having myself a gin. But you've just had tea. They can fight it out between them. Griselda, a matter of fact, I'm going to have three gins. But isn't it a little early From to start? From where I'm standing, it might already be a damn sight too late. <laughs> well, why the hell don't you join me? No, thank you. Suit yourself. Oh, own damned fault. Pardon? Should have cottoned onto the blighter long before this. I must be losing my grip. Was a time I'd have got his number before he got his size tens over the front door, Matt. Are you referring to our Mr. Jollit? Jollit. Jollit. I wonder how long it took him to dream that one up. Or perhaps his super duper pulled it from a hat. Super duper? Superintendent, dear. What? Police. Fuzz. Oh, God knows why I didn't tumble. What did he say that ridiculous wife's name was again? Violet. <laughs> Violet Jollet. Well, have you ever heard anything more unlikely? Who in their right mind would ever want to be supernaturally reunited with someone called Violet Jollet? Mr. Jollet! Hocus pocus, pudding and pie. Not that she ever existed, but like, like somebody opening the second half in old time music hall. Oh. Violet Jollet and her performing love doves. Osprey feather at the tent and her feathered friends dropping bird muck all over her velveteen and diamante ball gown, not to mention half the stalls. I'm still not sure I follow you, Griselda. Well, God knows how much clearer I can make it. Phony, through and through. Ah, Mr. Jollett. And for God's sake, stop calling him that. And Mrs. Jollett, too. Well, how else was he going to get himself over the front door? Oh. But if our Mr... Well, the gentleman isn't what he pretends... I thought I'd put you in the picture. He's either one of the plainclothes brigade or... or a hack. A hack? A scribbler. A scribbler? From one of those dreadful Sunday rags. All turge and true confession. Well, he doesn't look like a newspaper man. You've never seen a newspaper man. No. Well, then... <laughs> They're not all trilby hats and dirty trench coats, you know. No, I suppose they can't be. Still, had it coming. Had what coming? On the cards. That one day I'd probably get myself splashed right across the front page of one of the Sunday dreadfuls. Real life expose. Life after death racket. The sinister truth. You know the kind of thing. 
in one of those dreadful photographs they always find to go with it. Out of focus and slightly blurred around the edges. Griselda, dear, it, it, it wouldn't be true anyway. <sighs> Would it? So what the devil do you think I've been prattling on about? The big phony. <gasps> Always knew it, so now it's out of the bag. Good run for our money. Our money, Sister Edie, but over. I don't believe you. Then turn a blind eye again. Your option. Always been your prerogative in the past. Of course. True. Oh, Always true. Turn a blind eye to whatever you can't take. For you and Mumsy and dear dead Papa. The whole ridiculous charade of Arcadia Avenue. Over. Done with. Caput. Thank God. Your spiritual gift. Phony as hell. If you made it all up. All of it. Not Manco Capac. <laughs> it had a ring about it. Not the kind of thing they'd be likely to find in the telephone directory. But I heard him, Griselda. Your spirit voice. Mm, a fair stab at one, even if I do say so myself. First tried it out when I was playing one of the three witches in the Scottish play. Closed after three nights. Theatre Royal Hanley. <laughs> Little did I know years later it might still have its uses. By the way... Did you notice how your Mr. Jollett turned somersaults when he heard of my theatrical associations? <laughs> it must always be a bit of a giveaway, I suppose. He was admiring the pendant, Griselda. Uh, ah, mm. Pendant of the Emperor Manco Capac, mm -hmm. ruler of the Incas, mm. from out of the land of Cusco. Spirit guide of lesser mortals, bound in the bond of common clay. Oh, oh dear. Sorry, old girl. Bosh. All bosh. God knows where I even picked up that worthless bit of scrap iron. Probably with the rest of the junk in one of those sixpenny trays. I see. Edie? No. Just a bit of a headache. An early night. I'll take one of my pills... Well, perhaps even two. Oh, oh, what about your Biddy Buys cocoa? No, thank you, dear. I don't feel much like it tonight. No, not tonight. We have no way of knowing how long it was before Griselda followed Edie up the wooden hill. Gin had always been her tipple. It not only relaxed her, it gave her a, a warm feeling of righteous self-pity. And if she wasn't entitled to a large slice of that tonight, who the devil was? She could have been asleep for hours. She might just have closed her eyes. She lay fully clothed on top of the bed. She was perfectly aware of the distant town hall clock, and that damn ginger tom making its caterwauling next door. She was cold, reached down to pull the heavy eider down about her, but her hands lacked the strength, her intention, the purpose. She was pinioned, but not only by physical force, as though by hypnotism, behind her eyes, dragging her backwards through time, place, to a scene she seemed to know, recognize, as in a dream. But a dream that was about to become her reality. Hearken then, no sacred children of the sun. Let it be known through our ink and land that her denial of us, of our blessed sacred symbol, shall be avenged. Let the time be now. Raise high the sacred blade. The time of the living blood is upon us. The time is now. Now! Ah! 
the heart to be removed. See where it beats even now upon the altar of our forefathers. Even now. Even now. Even now. Even now. It was always Edie who coped with the ritual of early morning tea. She'd carefully avoid Griselda's pom-pommed carpet slippers, then set the cup gently down on her bedside table, draw her curtains to exactly the width she demanded, and then shake her gently, but firmly, by her shoulder, until she got the first grunt of awakening and recognition. But no grunt came. It took Edie a long time before she finally would accept that Griselda was dead. Seeding. But, uh, but it's not even Wednesday, Mr. Jollett. No, it isn't, is it? May I come in? I, uh, I don't know. Are you alone? Of course. But only for a minute, then. It's a terrible mess. I'd offer you some tea, but... I'm not really up to it. Oh, I quite understand. Uh, do you? Oh, I only called to offer my sympathy. If there's anything... How did you find out about my sister's... Miss Griselda's passing? A small paragraph in last evening's paper. Oh. But only a small paragraph, you say? Oh, I'm not sure she'd have been too happy about that. Notices, even the obituary kind, were very important to her. Banner headlines, a photograph, a bit out of focus, blurred around the edges, was the way she put it. When I opened the door to you just now, I quite expected popping camera bulbs and a black Mariah. I'd almost hoped for it. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, there's really no need to keep up the charade, you know. No need at all. Now, Mr. Jollett. I see. Oh, she saw through you all right. Right from the very start. Edie, she said. Edie, dear, the man's an imposter. Jollett. <laughs> Such a ridiculous name. Isn't it, though? There never was a late Mrs. Jollett either, was there? No. No. She roared her head off at that. Like somebody opening the second half in old time music hall. <laughs> she roared her head off at that. <laughs> How else could I have got to see her? False pretenses. It was important to me. So why assume a false identity? Oh no, the identity at least was my own. I, uh, I do have a card. Professor Henry Jollett. The letters will mean nothing to you. The National Institute of History. Ancient history. South American, to be exact. Specialising in early Incan cultures. Hmm. It really means nothing to me, Mr Jollett. No. But, for what it's worth, I'd like you to explain. Well, where to begin? Uh, just by chance, the wife of an associate put me onto your late sister's uh, activities. Oh. Forgive the scepticism. I, I'd never ventured into the spiritual world, but that didn't prevent me thinking I'd heard it all before. The substitution of an Incan emperor instead of your usual Indian chief gave it a certain twist. But I really had no intention of coming until I found myself here. Go on. It wasn't until she summoned the Emperor by name I, I started to take an interest. Ah, yes. Her great Manco Capac. Not exactly the kind of name you find in a telephone directory, is it? It's why she chose it, Mr. Jollett. Made it up? If you like. Except that she didn't. Hmm. 
Manco Capac, the predestined one, founder of the Inca dynasty, bearer of the staff of gold, protector of the family and the hearth, founder of the city called... Cusco! Exactly. Well, she could have researched it, of course. Except that she didn't. No, she didn't. As I listened to her, there were many details of the emperor, his fort city at Cusco, that no amateur, that, that, that even I, after a lifetime of study and only now beginning to alight on, a new world, long dead, but through her awakening again with a vigour and intensity I could never have aspired to. And yet, I doubt it. Right up until... Until? The very last time in this room. Uh. We were having tea. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I spotted it. Final proof of all I'd been so stupidly sceptical about. Her portrait? And about her neck, the royal seal pendant of the Incas. You'd seen it before? Only in the gloom, at a distance, across the table. She'd refused to ever let me handle it. But suddenly, here in her portrait, twenty, thirty years earlier, a very competent artist with all the time in the world to capture every detail. Will you permit me to see it? A pendant? If you wish it. She was wearing it when I found her. The clasp was broken, as though it had been torn from her neck. The autopsy was a necessary legal formality. In view of her age, excess weight, some kind of heart condition seemed the likeliest bet. In the antiseptic whiteness of their 20th century morgue, they made their preparations. A few know-it-all students jostled for a better view, sniggered at her large whiteness. There were no scars on her body, not even an appendectomy. But when her cadaver was eventually opened, they found no heart, only the severed aorta and the cavity where it had once lain. Miss Edie was offered a 